Welcome back everyone to another deep dive. Today we're going deep on irrigation scheduling, you know, figuring out when and how much we should be watering. Exactly. We've got some great material to work with for this one. Yeah. Some excerpts from a Toro manual all about irrigation scheduling. Should be fun. So get ready to uh, learn how to really make the most of your water and, uh, you know, not waste that precious resource. Right. It's a lot more than just turning on the sprinklers and hoping for the best. For sure. We're going to be looking at uh, some pretty in-depth stuff, like the water balance method. Okay. And how to calculate those uh, all important run times for your irrigation system. Yeah. And, and really just understanding all those factors that go into smart irrigation decisions. So before we get into the uh, the real nitty gritty, sure. can we take a step back and just talk about why irrigation scheduling is such a big deal? I mean, we all know plants need water. Yeah. But what's the real impact of getting it right? Well, I think it all comes down to efficiency. You know, you want to be giving your crops exactly what they need when they need it. Right. No more, no less. Kind of like treating your garden like a finely tuned machine. Oh, I like that. Where where every drop of water is is really contributing to optimal growth and yield. So no more wilting plants and no more wasted water. Exactly. I'm on no. board with that. The manual mentions understanding plant water use as a starting point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it talks about transpiration and how plants drink. Right. It's always been such a fascinating process to me. It really is like a hidden world. It is. Uh, you know, you got the water traveling all the way from the roots up through the plant system, and then eventually it evaporates out of those tiny pores on the leaves. Right. The stomata. Exactly. The stomata. And it's all powered by the sun. Yeah. You know, using that solar energy to kind of pull the water up and distribute those nutrients throughout the plant. Yeah. It's mind blowing to think about all that's happening at such a tiny level. It is. But how do we translate this knowledge into, you know, an actual irrigation strategy? Well, that's where the uh, the research comes in. Okay. You know, scientists have uh, they fi figured out how to estimate how much water specific crops need. Oh, wow. Uh, based on all sorts of factors, yeah. you know, weather, the type of soil. Yeah. And even the plant stage of growth. So we're not just guessing anymore. We have real data to guide us. Data-driven gardening. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Uh, the manual also touches on different irrigation strategies. Uh -huh. It even compares a typical schedule to a drip irrigation system. Right. Uh, with a helpful little graph. Really highlights the difference in how often you have to water. Yeah. With drip irrigation, you're usually running it more often. Yeah. Keeping that soil consistently moist. Right. Kind of like giving your plants small, regular sips of water. Okay, so small sips versus, uh, you know, with sprinklers or flood irrigation. It's like yeah. we're giving them a big gulp every now and then. Exactly. And and while that might seem like it's saving water, yeah. it's, it's not always the most efficient way to go. Interesting. The real key is to maintain that optimum moisture level in the root zone. Okay. And that can vary a lot, you know, depending on the plant. Right. What growth stage it's in. Right. And even the, the quality you're aiming for. So, like... A thirsty tomato plant might need a totally different watering schedule than, say, a succulent. Exactly. Succulents are pretty drought tolerant. Right. They don't need as much. So how do we how do we figure out this optimum moisture level? Is there is there a way to measure it? Absolutely. Mm. You know, a simple field test can be surprisingly accurate. Okay. Just dig down a few inches into the soil. Uh huh. And and if it feels moist but crumbles easily in your hand, yeah, you're in the sweet spot. Okay. If it's too wet, it'll kind of clump together. Yeah. And if it's too dry, it'll feel, you know, really dusty. Right. Right. Makes sense. You can also, you know, look for clues like wilting leaves. Yeah, good point. Or cracks in the soil. So it's like becoming a soil detective. It is. So we've got a good feel now for the why and the what of irrigation scheduling. Right. But how do we actually put it into practice? That's where the water balance method comes in. Okay. It's, uh, it's a way to figure out both when and for how long to irrigate. Oh. And the basic idea is we're treating the root zone like a bank account. A bank account. Yeah. I like that. We're tracking the water coming in from rain or irrigation. Okay. And the water going out through evapotranspiration. The manual actually calls it a water bank account. It does. Yeah. And it even compares overwatering to an overdraft. That's a great analogy. Yeah. It really helps you visualize how you need to keep that account balanced. Right, right, right. So to figure out how much water to deposit each time you irrigate, yeah. we need to calculate something called the runtime. Runtime, got it. And, yeah. and the manual actually gives us a pretty straightforward formula for that. It's uh, 
crop water use divided by net application rate all multiplied by 60. Okay, sounds simple enough. It is, once you understand those components. Yeah. And the good news is, even though those components might seem a bit intimidating at first, mm -hmm. we can often uh, find pre-calculated data or use online tools oh, nice. to make the whole process a lot easier. So we don't have to be math whizzes to become irrigation masters. Yeah, that's exactly the sound of that. Yeah. So let's break down those components, starting with crop water use. Okay. The manual uses the term ETC, which I know stands for evapotranspiration of the crop. What exactly are we measuring there? Essentially, it's how much water a crop is losing through both evaporation from the soil right. and transpiration from the plant itself. So you can think of it as the plant's total water demand. So it's like the plant's daily water intake, but instead of drinking, it's, you know, breathing out that moisture. That's a great way to put it, yeah. I try. And to determine this ETC, we need to consider a few things, right? Right. The manual provides this handy table with average reference evapotranspiration rates, yeah. uh, ETO for short, which, as you might expect, varies depending on your climate. Yeah, your location. And time of year. Absolutely. Good. You know, a scorching summer day is going to demand a lot more water than a cool, cloudy spring day. Right. That makes sense. But what about the plant itself? Yeah. Don't different species have different water needs? Absolutely. And that's where the crop coefficient comes in. Okay. It's it's a value that's specific to the type of plant. Uh-huh. And it kind of adjusts for its unique water needs. The manual actually has a graph showing how the crop coefficient changes throughout the growing season for potatoes. Oh, cool. It's, it's interesting to see how the plant's demand fluctuates as it grows. So we're factoring in the weather, the type of plant, and its growth stage exactly. to get a really tailored etc. But the manual also mentions crop coverage, yeah. especially for young plants that aren't covering the entire ground. Uh -huh. Why is that important? Well, think about uh, a newly planted orchard. Those young trees only shade a small portion of the soil, right? Right. Which means less water is being lost to evaporation. Gotcha. So the manual highlights this two to one ratio rule, meaning if a young orchard shades, let's say, 20% of the ground, yeah, it might only need about 40% of the water of a mature orchard that's fully shading the soil. Oh, so we really need to adjust our watering based on how much ground the plants are actually covering. Exactly. That's a really helpful tip, especially for those of us with you know young gardens or orchards. But how do we make these ETC calculations like work for us in a practical way? Well, the good news is we don't have to do all the heavy lifting ourselves. Okay, good. There are tons of resources out there, mm -hmm. you know, including pre-calculated ETC tables. Oh, great. And even online tools. Awesome. Where you can just plug in your plant type, your location, the growth stage, and they'll give you that magic number. That sounds much less daunting than crunching numbers all day long. Right. The formula also mentions net application rate. What does that mean exactly? It's basically how much water is actually reaching the root zone during irrigation. Okay. And it's directly tied to how uniform your irrigation system is. Okay. You know, a system with high uniformity delivers water nice and evenly, mm. like, a, like a perfectly calibrated sprinkler system. Right, right. Low uniformity means some areas are getting drenched while others are staying dry. Yeah, that's not good. Which leads to waste and, you know, stressed out plants. Of course. The manual actually shows a visual comparison of systems with different uniformity. It does. Yeah, and the difference is pretty striking. Oh, wow. Yeah, it is. It really shows you how much variation there can be. Yeah. So it's not it's not just about the amount of water we're putting out. Right. We also have to factor in, you know, the efficiency of the system. Absolutely. Like if if we're losing half of that water to run off or overspray, all our calculations go out the window, right? Exactly. That's why drip irrigation is often seen as, uh, you know, a water-saving champion. Right, right. Because those systems <laughs> can achieve such high uniformity. Yeah. You know, delivering the water right to the root zone with very little waste. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But even with a really efficient system, we still have to figure out that, uh, you know, ideal runtime. So how do we actually put all these pieces together. Well, this is where that water balance method really shines. Okay. It's all about, like we said, keeping track of our water bank account. Right. Subtracting what the plant uses each day. Okay. And then adding back any rainfall or, you know, supplemental irrigation we're providing. Okay. So we're constantly like monitoring and adjusting to keep things in balance. Exactly. What's really interesting to me is that, you know, the manual emphasizes real world observation. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like we can't just rely on the numbers. Right. We have to actually get out there, you know, get our hands dirty. Absolutely. You have to kind of check the pulse of your garden, so to speak. I love that. You can use that field test we talked about. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, observe the leaves, see how they're looking, how firm they are. Right. Or even, uh, you know, invest in a soil moisture meter. Oh, yeah. For even more precise readings. So it's really about like becoming a plant whisperer. It is. You know, really getting in tune with them. But even with all these tools and calculations, it can still feel kind of daunting. You yeah. know, like putting together a whole season irrigation schedule. It, it can be a bit overwhelming for sure. Yeah. But thankfully, there are a lot of uh, resources out there to help us. Okay, good. You know, the manual mentions these uh, online scheduling tools. Oh, cool. And even spreadsheets that can kind of simplify the process. Okay. You know, you can plug in your plant type, your location, your soil type, and even weather forecasts, and it'll help you create a, a customized schedule. So technology really is coming to the rescue here. It is. But I imagine even with those tools, there's still a lot of, like, fine-tuning and adjusting based on what you're actually seeing. Absolutely. Every garden, every farm is different. Right. And conditions can change really quickly. You know, a yeah. sudden heat wave or an unexpected downpour can throw off even the most carefully crafted schedule. Yeah, for sure. So it's crucial to to stay vigilant right. and really adjust your irrigation based on, you know, what you're seeing in your plants and feeling in that soil. So it's like this blend of science and intuition. Exactly. We're using the data, the tools to kind of guide us. Yeah. But we also have to trust our instincts and observations. Absolutely. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at, uh, you know, reading those subtle cues from your plants. Right. You'll start to anticipate their needs and really fine tune that watering schedule accordingly. So all this talk about efficient irrigation, I mean, what does it really mean for, you know, the average gardener, the average farmer? Okay. Like, why should we really care about getting this dialed in? Well, I think the benefits are, are multifaceted. Okay. First and foremost, you know, efficient irrigation leads to healthier, more productive plants. Okay, so happier plants and bigger harvests. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm already sold on that. Yeah. But I think beyond just those immediate benefits, you know, there's also the environmental impact to think about. Huge, yeah. So by using water wisely, we're not just saving this precious resource, but we're also protecting our ecosystems. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, overwatering can lead to runoff. Right. And that runoff can carry uh, fertilizers, pesticides, all sorts of stuff into waterways. Right. Which can harm aquatic life and even pollute our drinking water. It's like this ripple effect. And our choices with irrigation really do play a part in the bigger picture. They do. They really do. Yeah. And as water becomes more and more scarce in many parts of the world, you know, responsible irrigation is just going to become even more critical. Yeah. It's about making sure we have a sustainable future for ourselves and for generations to come. Okay, so efficient irrigation is good for our plants, it's good for their wallets, and it's good for the planet. That's a win-win-win. I'm convinced. But I, I have to admit, it can still feel a little overwhelming. Like, where do we even start? Yeah. Well, I think the best place to start is by really getting to know your plants. Okay. What are their specific water requirements? Mm-hmm. Do they like to have consistently moist soil, or do they prefer to dry out a bit between waterings? Right. You know, do your research. And then really pay attention to how they respond to, to different watering regimes. So it's about being, you know, really attentive to those individual needs and preferences. Exactly. And then we can, you know, factor in our climate, our soil type. Yeah, all those things. A sandy soil is going to drain much faster than a clay soil, for example. Right, right, of course. And we can't forget to evaluate our irrigation systems, too. Absolutely. You know, make sure there are no leaks. Adjust those sprinkler heads if you need to. Yeah, and even consider upgrading to more efficient systems, like we talked about with drip irrigation. Or, even small improvements can make a big difference. And I think, you know, there's no shame in asking for help either. Oh, absolutely not. You know, we can reach out to local experts, master gardeners, even irrigation professionals. Right? Yeah, they can be a huge help. To get advice that's tailored to our specific situation. For sure. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We've talked about the water balance method. We dove into those crop water use calculations right. and really explored the importance of system uniformity and, you know, getting out there and making those real world observations. Yeah, it's all connected. And we even touched on some helpful tools and resources. Right, to make things a little easier. Yeah, to really simplify the process and, you know, make us all more efficient irrigators. Exactly. But before we wrap up this deep dive, I kind of want to bring us back to, like, 
the human element of all this. Sure. You know, we've talked a lot about the science of irrigation. Yeah. But wouldn't you say there's also an art to it? Absolutely. You know, it's about developing a feel for your garden. Right. Understanding those subtle cues that your plants are giving you uh -huh. and responding accordingly. It's about connecting with those natural rhythms of growth and water. It's almost like developing a relationship with your garden, like a, like a dance between you and your plants. I love that. That's a beautiful way to put it. I try. And, and as you develop that relationship, you'll find that irrigation becomes more intuitive, right? more rewarding, less of a chore, and more of a practice of nurturing and stewardship. So as we conclude our deep dive into irrigation scheduling, let's remember that it's not just about saving water or, you know, maximizing yields. Yeah. It's about fostering this deeper connection with the natural world and, you know, contributing to a more sustainable future. Well said. And with all the knowledge and insights we've uh, we've covered in this deep dive, our listener is uh, is well equipped to embark on their own irrigation journey. That's right. One that's both efficient and fulfilling. Yeah, I, I really like that perspective. You know, it's not just about following the rules or, uh, you know, memorizing formulas. It's about, you know, really understanding the language of our plants uh -huh. and and responding with, uh, you know, care and intention. Exactly. And and as you, as you gain more experience, mm -hmm. you'll really start to see the interconnectedness of you know, everything in the garden, yeah. the soil, the plants, uh, the weather, even those beneficial in insects and, and microorganisms. It really is like a whole ecosystem. It is. And we're learning to, you know, work in harmony with it all. Precisely. And and speaking of harmony, I wanted to touch on something that the manual mentions briefly, um, this concept of deficit irrigation. Okay. Have you ever heard of that? Vaguely. I, I'd love to learn more. It it sounds kind of counterintuitive, like intentionally limiting water to certain plants. It is a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. But it can actually be a really powerful tool for achieving certain quality goals. Oh, interesting. Like, for example, uh, some fruit crops actually develop a much sweeter flavor. Really? When they're subjected to, uh, you know controlled water stress during specific growth stages. Yeah. So it's almost like we're challenging the plant to to really concentrate those sugars and flavors. Exactly. And it's not just about flavor either. Oh. Deficit irrigation can also be used to um, to promote drought tolerance, okay. improve the color of the fruit, or even control the size of the plant. Wow. It's amazing how we can use water or I guess, you know, the lack of water to really influence so many aspects of plant growth. But I imagine deficit irrigation requires like a really deep understanding of the plant's needs. It does. And and some pretty careful monitoring, right? Yeah. To make sure we're not stressing it out too much. Absolutely. It's not a strategy to be undertaken lightly. Yeah, yeah. You really need to know exactly when and how much to restrict the water without compromising the plant's overall health. Right. So it's it's like this delicate dance, it is, you know, yeah. pushing the boundaries, but making sure the plant still has everything it needs to thrive. This deep dive has really opened my eyes to, like, all the complexities of irrigation scheduling. It's it's a lot more than meets the eye. It really is. And it's got me feeling really inspired to, to experiment, Good. you know, try new techniques, and really just connect with my garden on a deeper level. That's great. And as you as you continue on that irrigation journey, yeah. just remember that there are a ton of resources out there to, to help you along the way. For sure. You know, don't hesitate to reach out to, uh, to local experts, right. join gardening communities, or even explore some online forums, you know, to share your experiences and learn from others. Yeah. And we can always learn so much from each other. So to wrap up this deep dive, what's what's the one key takeaway you want our listener to walk away with? I'd say it's this. Efficient irrigation isn't just about following rules or memorizing formulas. It's really about developing that relationship with your plants and with your environment. Mm -hmm. Understanding the interconnectedness of everything in your garden. Yeah. And then yeah. and then using water wisely to to really nurture a thriving ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. So as we sign off today, let's all raise a glass or or have a watering can to the art and science of efficient irrigation. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, everyone. We'll see you next time.